Aloha, friends. This is Matthew Gray, and welcome to my show, 50 Tastes of Gray, where we explore the many shades of health and nutrition, from time to time, that is. Today, we're bridging the gap between two worlds. On one side, there's me, a firm believer in the science that warns us against the perils of ultra-processed foods, seed oils, and sugar. My approach is strict, but it's one that I stand by for long-term health. Now, this hasn't been a lifelong thing for me. This is pretty brand new, but I do like to share it when it comes up, and I'll speak my truth to it every time. On the other side, today's guest is the wonderful Emily Zorn. She's a registered dietitian with a refreshingly balanced approach. Emily is the embodiment of moderation, guiding her clients with a gentle hand and a wealth of knowledge from her experiences. Emily's approach is to eat good 80% of the time, which is better than what most people do. My personal opinion is, in this day and age, when half the population is obese, diabetic, and metabolically at risk, and those numbers are growing at epidemic levels, one must go balls to the wall on their health. I don't know if 80% is enough. Though our methods may differ, our goal is the same, to help you lead a healthier life. While I may advocate for a stringent path, I admire Emily's ability to make nutrition accessible and achievable for many. She's very mellow. Her role is slow. Mine is not when it comes to this. I'm intolerant of the disease we're all seeing, much of it due to the food we eat. Today, we're not here to have a food fight, as I mentioned during the show, but to share insights and open a dialogue about what healthy eating can look like for you. Without further ado, let's welcome Emily Zorn and discover how even the most divergent food philosophies can converge at the table of wellness. Hello, hello. Hello. Emily, at long last, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Really good. Thank you so much for coming aboard. You're so welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm loving your license plate. That's the first thing I saw, the Hawaii Eat license plate in the back. That license plate was my license plate for my Hawaii food tours then from 2004 to 2020 when COVID happened. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty famous license plate, and I I grabbed it. I would not return that. Good for you. That's iconic. I love it. Wonderful. I always start off every show by asking my guests, what have you eaten today? Oh, okay. Let me think back. Um, What did I start out with? I made myself a breakfast burrito. So just eggs, cheese, tortilla, really simple salsa. Um, And then I went to a dance class and I knew I was hopping on here and I didn't have a lot of time. So I had a protein bar and I'm drinking a, a latte. So something to get me through till I get lunch afterwards. But I love that question. That sounds good. Is is food a really huge part of your life? I'm going to say yes. Definitely. Yes. Uh And, you know, being a dietitian and my husband's also a dietitian, everyone assumes we have the healthiest household in the world. And I'll be very honest, like I have a bag of chips right here. Like we eat chips, we eat everything, but um, we're really just lovers of food, but also lovers of health. So finding a good balance is important. I'm thinking about food all day long. It's it's work and it's my life, but I I really enjoy it. Yeah, you know, that's the same way as, as I've always been. Definitely, yes. And that's a big piece of when... We travel as well. Food is probably one of the most important pieces for us. So that ties right in with that. Before you go traveling, or at least what I always did was I'd always read up in advance or check the restaurants. You know, if I know where I'm going for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I don't really have to worry about anything else. A one week vacation really means 21 meals. And that's everything else can come around that, right? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Priorities. I know that you're a registered dietitian, and I'm definitely not here to have any sort of a food fight, although I think it might be a little bit fun if we did. Um, It it definitely would be. You know, I want to ask you a little bit about what kind of an education are registered dietitian and nutritionists given so our audience can kind of understand where you're coming from. Sure. Yes. So I can speak only for USA because every country has their own 
you know, ways of certifying dietitians, nutritionists, all of that. But um, the difference between a registered dietitian and a nutritionist is that registered dietitian, it's a very specific path. So to go to an undergraduate college degree that has an accredited program that's typically four years, and then you have to do an internship that's usually a year long, and it's all sorts of different rotations. There's a clinical rotation, food service, um, long-term care, all sorts of rotations, and then you take a board a board exam, and then you're a dietitian. Um, nutritionist is a little looser, right? There are nutritionist certifications out there. Technically, anyone could call themselves a nutritionist, but a dietitian is a very specific path. That's the path I took. And I would say overall, it's very science heavy, very science based. And it's been interesting as I've gone on in my career, taking that science based, but making it fun and interesting for people mm -hmm. and like food should be fun. It should be enjoyable. So that's really my goal. You know, that's kind of a great approach. Uh, would you ever consider that maybe making food too much fun? is the reason why half our audience right now has metabolic syndrome, diabetes, or is obese or on their way to being that way? I think that, yes, the too much fun piece is a part of it. The emotional eating is a part of it, right? Using food to feel a certain way, to feel comforted, to feel happy, this and that, and just our environment. Like it makes, uh, it could go on and on, but there are many different reasons why it's just easier much of the time to not eat healthy. I think it's important to help people meet them where they are and say, in your situation, how can you make a few small changes to be healthy? Not going all the way down the diet path and saying now everything you eat has to be perfect, but with what they're working with now, what are a few small changes they can make that would be effective? So when a client comes to you and says, hey, Emily, uh help me a little bit. We think it might have something to do with my nutritional part of my life. Mm -hmm. What do you do at that point? How do you locate and, and identify their goals? Well, that is always the first thing. So we never start off by talking about food. We always start off by talking about what would be your dream scenario in six months? Where do you want to be? And then talking about why is that important to you? Because anyone can say, oh, I want to be healthier. I want to lose weight, this, this, and that. But those are very surface level. I like to dig a little deeper and say, well, these are your goals, but why? And how will your life be different when you do accomplish that? And really get to the motivation because food is tough. Like food is something that you make many decisions throughout the day. And if you want to make a change and get to a goal, there needs to be a really solid motivation. So um, yeah, we don't even start talking about food right off the bat. It's definitely a little bit of, you know, digging and questioning and coming up with why does this matter to you? So if I were to turn that, to turn the table on you and ask you, where would you want to be in six months? How would you then express your response to that? That's a really good question that nobody has ever asked me. I feel very much at peace with food, with how I'm, you know, approaching my day-to-day -day eating. It's very balanced. And so in six months, where I would want to be is honestly right where I am now. Just mm -hmm. feeling very confident in my choices, knowing that I know how to fill my kitchen with foods that are healthy and filling and make me feel good. I know how to cook a few meals that are wholesome and taste. I'm just eating in a way that is fueling me for my current life, which is I work, I go on walks, I do dance classes, things like that. So if I were training for something or if I had a big backpacking trip coming up, that would probably change. You know, I'd have to change my eating, but yeah, that's the truthful answer for me. I don't want to have a food fight, but I do want to Go back to the beginning at the top of the show and I asked you what you've eaten today. Um, mm -hmm. A couple of things that you responded to in that response was a protein bar and mm -hmm. chips, which are both what I think are considered ultra processed products. And how does that fit into a healthy lifestyle? So I always tell people, and this is, I should preface this by saying nutrition is extremely personalized. So Everything I say, all the advice I give, take it with a grain of salt because 
it's going to be different for every person. But in general, and what I find works for me is I try to do about 80, 20. So 80% of the time it's whole foods, it's fruits and vegetables and whole grains, lean proteins, all of that 80% of the time. And that leaves 20% of the time for right before I hopped on today, I had 10 minutes. I didn't have time to cook a whole meal, but I did have a protein bar and a handful of chips and that will get me through. So the, my approach now is the rest of the day, my lunch, my dinner, it's going to be 80% foods because I had my 20% foods already. So for me, that's where it fits in. Um, and I know people have their different approaches. Some people feel better eating 100% of the whole foods, 100% of the healthy foods. Um, for me, it just fits better in my life to have a bit of a bit of a balance. So it's just deciding what works best for you. And at the end of the day, how do you feel after eating a certain way? If you're feeling good, if you're feeling energized, that's a way to tell that this way of eating works for me. Everything in moderation, even ex excess is what you might design for somebody on a bespoke level. If someone is coming to you and wanting to help themselves. Yes, that's my approach. And I recognize mm -hmm. It's not for everyone. And there are dietitians who will be a lot more strict and a lot more, you know, let's minimize processed food completely. And I'm, you know, that's completely fine. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not the dietitian for everyone, but I am the dietitian for, you know, for a, a subset of people. And I try to serve them as best I can. You know, it seems like when people are young and fit, and healthy like you are really don't have to pay as close attention to their diet and their metabolism at any given moment. But as we age, have you found that some of your older clients saying, you know, I've gained a few pounds over the last few years. What can I do about that? So how do you work with somebody who is not young and invincible and fit like you are? Thank you. Um, yeah, so that happens all the time. Probably 50% of my clients are age 50 and older because they recognize the way that I've eaten my entire life is not serving me anymore. And the way that I used to adjust my diet to make it a little bit healthier, it's not making any changes. So I always start off that conversation by saying, you know, about every 10 years, our body does change and we need to respond with a different diet, right? The way that we ate when we were 20 or 30 is not going to cut it when you're 50, 60, 70. Right. So yeah, a few things we'll talk about is really just looking through the diet and seeing, okay, we talk about balance, but is the balance pushing too much towards those 20% foods? How do we really find a balance that is now working for your new body or the, the body that you have now and the metabolism that you have now. So again, this is very personalized, but yeah. in general, for most people, they're not getting enough protein and protein is super important as you age. Um, a lot of it is just muscle related because as you age, it gets harder to hold on to the muscle you have and a lot of muscle wasting happens. So Eating a lot of high quality protein can help with that. And then also doing resistance exercise. So I'm not a personal trainer, so I don't give out prescriptions for that. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. those two things paired together can really work wonders for people as they age. Yeah, no, that sounds like a great response. What kind of uh, things are going on right now as far as myths that you're seeing widely spread on the Internet or otherwise about food and diet? Good question. So I, I have a whole podcast where we answer these questions. So RDs versus BS, registered dietitians versus BS. And we're on episode 84. So we have 84 different topics of things that are out there, whether it's, you know, the keto diet, intermittent fasting. Um, we most recently, well, this week we're doing an episode on alcohol and really talking about, okay, what is the truth behind these things and what's BS or the myths really? So there's, there's so many, it's hard to just, you know, pinpoint it down to one thing. Um, I have listened to your show and I really like it. You two are really good. Great. Thank you. Yes. It's uh, always fun to collaborate with other podcasters because oh, yeah. we can really relate on a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, okay. Well, instead of then 
addressing any of the myths that are going around. Let me just kind of switch gears with you for a second. Sound good? Okay. What do you make of the American Heart Association being able to get its logo on boxes of Cheerios or Chex or Frosted Flakes? What do you make of that kind of thing that's going on? Yeah. So if we're really breaking it down, like I, I kind of get what they're saying. Like solu- it, what it is, is that soluble fiber is heart healthy. It helps lower cholesterol, all of these things. And, you know, technically, yes, there's soluble fiber in Cheerios. Is it the best way to get soluble fiber? There, there are better ways. There are many fruits and many vegetables that include it or just eating oats on their own, right? Um, but I also understand the hang up behind, okay, there's got to be some money being exchanged and you know we're promoting these processed foods. So it's a big topic. And I, you know, personally, I don't know a whole lot about what goes on behind closed doors with all of that. But would it be better if they were putting that little symbol on your know, fruits and vegetables and encouraging that? Absolutely. Yes. I think we have a long way to go to be in that situation. But yeah, it's that's a good question and and a tough one. What's the name of your radio podcast? Our podcast is RDs versus BS. Okay, so BS stands for bullshit, right? It does, yes. Okay. Going back to the Heart Association, taking people's money and in return, uh, putting a heart healthy sticker on crap products that are definitely not healthy. And you might even go so far as say unhealthy is a corrupt kind of corporate thing. Are you willing to go there? I don't necessarily label any food as this is going to be bad for you. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's just my approach. I, I say that the amount matters. Having a little bit of anything Besides trans fat, which now we're getting a little sciencey, but trans fat is the one thing that any amount is bad for your heart. It lowers good cholesterol and raises bad cholesterol. When you really break down food, it's it's just made up of macronutrients, micronutrients, additives involved, chemicals, all of these things. But my approach is that the dose makes the poison, that small amounts of anything is not going to make or break your diet. And that's where the whole balance thing comes in. So I, I get that. I understand what you're saying, a small amount, but a small amount on a daily basis over a lifetime is a huge amount. And so let's just take sugar. That's proven to create inflammation. So if sugar is proven to be inflammatory and seed oils are proven to be inflammatory, then could we revise that statement that maybe there are certain things other than trans fats that you should not be having over a lifetime? So my thoughts when it comes to inflammation is that there, you know, at least with my approach, there are going to be foods that are pro-inflammatory that you eat. So I just balance it out with antioxidants and anti-inflammatory foods. So if I'm eating more of the foods that are anti-inflammatory and antioxidant in a 80 to 20 percent range, then that's okay. I also understand, yes, a small amount of not so good for us things over a whole lifetime does does add up. So it's important to not just take it day by day, but week by week and month by month, like really looking at your diet. And if you do choose to eat things that, you know, they're not the healthiest, let's be honest, there are, you know, foods that are pro-inflammatory, let's balance it out with anti-inflammatory foods. And then you can't have the best of both worlds, but the amount definitely matters. Yeah. Do you think that there's an issue related to what they call big food, big medicine, and big pharma also kind of being in a position to not do us as well as we'd like, and that maybe we're on our own in a lot of ways? Yeah, this gets very complicated, but that is whenever I am doing research for my podcast, for a client, it's always going to the peer-reviewed research and always looking for those um, conflicts of interest, like who did fund this? Because Mm -hmm. that totally changes the quality of the research. So yeah, at the end of the day, you know, what I recommend for people is go to the science, go to the research, understand that it's not perfect because it keeps changing because we keep learning new things. Um, And that, yeah, the, you know, with big corporations, there's a lot going on behind closed doors. So 
if you do choose to do your own research, make sure that you're, again, looking at scientific studies that are high quality, are peer reviewed, have been published, all of these different things, because you can't, I think a lot of people and a lot of companies just quote science in general and say, there's research saying this, but if you look at the research, it's bad. It's on five people or it's, you know, funded by the company that they're trying to sell those products. So right. it's not black and white. Yeah. There's, yeah, there's a, a big gray area there. You know, it's difficult for us mere mortals to do any sort of research or drilling deeply into any sort of scientific study. Everything is so politically motivated, even food science, because there is so much money behind it and there's that profit center. It's difficult for a regular person if they don't have good information and it's hard to get how to really improve their diet. Half of our audience right now is suffering from obesity or diabetes or on their way to that. And they want to lose a few pounds on top of that. And who knows what else might be going on. I'm trying to address the people who are in need, not the people who are really healthy, who are watching or listening to us now. Sure. Let's take a, a sidebar and let me ask you, do you believe that there are any aphrodisiac qualities to food? Oh, gosh. Okay. I, I haven't looked into the actual research behind this. I've heard theories about... Things like oysters and chocolate and stuff like that. But I can't say with 100% certainty that there is or isn't. I haven't you know, looked at the science lately, but it's a good question. Okay. What works for me? I guess I, I've never really given it that much thought, honestly. Uh -huh. So you don't connect romance and food in any particular way? I guess the way that I connect it is... You know, my husband and I are both dietitians and we both love food. So the way that food is romantic for us is we just enjoy cooking together. So if I think there's something romantic about picking out your food, picking out a recipe, cooking together, making a date out of that. Um, so that would be the connection that I see. Uh -huh. Do you guys cook a lot together? Um, yeah, we do. He's He is a pretty demanding job. So he's not always home around dinner time, but when he is, we try to, you know, on the weekends and whenever we can, we enjoy cooking together. So a typical argument or disagreement between the two dietitians, mm -hmm. what is that like? Oh, well, he is very much in the mindset of for intensity when it comes to approaching a diet, he works uh -huh. with football players. So right. it's very much like, this is the way to eat. And He's not so much in the balance. He's very much into the 100% of the time, eat this way, lots of protein spread throughout the day, lots of vegetables, things like that. And mm -hmm. I'm more of the, you know, open to all foods, open to the balance. So, um, yeah, that, you know, it's two very different approaches, but works well with the different populations that we work right. with. Right. Okay, your clientele obviously is different than athletes and so on. Yes. So, of course, their yeah. needs are going to be different. Uh huh. Absolutely. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about how people find you and and what the primary goal is when they do contact you and they say, "Hey, Em, can you help me?" Yeah. Yeah. So people typically find me, you know, a lot through my podcast. It's probably you know fifty percent of my clients come from that. But I also have a website, emilyzorn dot com. I have an Instagram, Emily underscore RD underscore, and people will find me through those ways. But when someone reaches out, they've really gotten to the point where they've tried all the diets. They've tried keto. They've tried fasting. They've tried paleo. They've tried low carb. They've tried all the different things and nothing's really working. Mm -hmm. And they're ready for a change that can last. So when I work with people, my goal is always by the end that they can continue what we're doing for the rest of their life. And it's not meant to be a, in these three months, you'll lose 20 pounds and then you're on your own. It's mm -hmm. really much more of a, let's take the way you're eating now. Let's look at your goals. Let's make some changes, create a habit. So you know how to eat for the rest of your life. I guess uh, sustainability is a really important issue and uh, because it is so difficult to be persistent and determined 24-7. And that's kind of what it takes, really. If you're going to change over your diet and your nutrition, 
you really do need to be focused on taking care of yourself on a daily basis. Do you sound like you make it very easy on people? I try to, because I think there are enough people in programs and just diet culture out there that the other way works for some people, but the people who find me, it has not worked for them. They just Mm. need a partner. They need someone who can support them and someone who's not going to give them a totally new grocery list and say, throw out everything in your kitchen. This is what you're eating now. So for the people who I work with, it tends to be more sustainable and last for longer because I take what they're already doing and we just make adjustments. There's not one diet plan that I make everyone go on because I have clients who are vegan and I have clients who eat everything and I have clients who don't have time to cook and I have, you know, all sorts of different things. So again, where the personalization comes in. And working with them and seeing how far they're able to push without feeling overwhelmed is really Mm -hmm. important. Do you think that people who are on a vegan or plant-based diet can actually attain great health? I think that they can. I think really any way of eating, you can be healthy. But I don't think that one way of eating is healthy for everyone. So some people feel great on a vegan diet. Some people feel great on a plant-based diet. Some people don't. And that's okay because if the, any diet is approached correctly and you're getting the right amount of macronutrients, micronutrients, then you can be healthy. It just depends on what a person likes and what they're willing and able to do. So you really don't put up the cross to ultra high processed foods. You don't set your foot down and say, you know, everything in moderation, except don't eat trans fats and maybe don't eat ultra processed foods? Is that part of your thing or is that allowable in your approach? The only thing that I say do not eat is anything with trans fat, which a lot of ultra high processed foods do have trans fat in them, like Mm -hmm. donuts and fried food, you know, all of these different things. But there are foods that technically, yeah, they're ultra high processed. And I say, if you eat an amount that can be balanced out by more of the healthy stuff, then that's okay. Yeah. Well, you can tell that I'm a tiny bit more militant about it now than than you are just comparing the two of us. And this would probably because, you know, I'm probably twice your age (laughs) and I've lived a different kind of a life and lifestyle. So my approach with that is definitely not in the gray area. Mm -hmm. It's way more extreme, but I love speaking with people who have such knowledge like you. You would definitely be in a similar mindset as my husband who very much has, you know, black and white. These are the foods you should be eating. These are the foods they shouldn't. And we're both dietitians. So I just think it's, it is interesting to talk with people with different approaches because let's be honest, all of them are okay because there are so many different people and so, and everyone needs a different approach. So it's, it's interesting to hear everyone's thoughts on it. You know, it's really interesting, Emily. I don't know if this happens to you, but it's happened to me and several hundred people I've spoken to about taking care of themselves. I asked them, when was the last time you went to your doctor and he or she asked you, what have you eaten today? Never. And the answer has always been never. I think that that's such an important factor that our medical establishment has no freaking idea (laughs) about what's right for us. Yeah, Yeah. they can set a bone or they can, they can do a surgery on you. But if, you're, if they're asked how you can take care of yourself on a day-to-day basis by way of diet, which is what we put into ourselves constantly, they have no clue. I have a friend who's a pain specialist and he's awesome pain specialist. He can perform all of those very, very delicate operations and so on. But you ask him about what to eat and he has no clue at all. Yeah, we're missing the preventative part in health. And, you know, it's good that we have a health system that can take care of us when we are sick. But Mm -hmm. yeah, I I definitely lean more towards the, how can we make this system help people preventatively? Like with nutrition, my services aren't covered under insurance because it's preventative. Unless someone already has diabetes, already has kidney disease, then it's covered. And I'm biased. I'm a, you know, dietitian. I think food's very important, but 
why is that not the case? Why don't we want to prevent people from getting these diseases in the first place? Right. Well, that comes down to, in my opinion, the whole big pharma thing. So it's the big food thing that gets us sick and it's a big pharma thing that kind of like stamps us out. that whole profit motivation, I believe. And so it's difficult to find good people like yourself or me, someone who can help guide regular folks away from the whole profit center of big food and pharma and be able to help them lead a happy life, you know, and a good future. It's difficult to find those kind of people. Uh, I want to circle back to any of the big BS myths out there that are, that are in the media that you want to address. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to have to think on this one because there's just, okay. you know what, it <laughs> might be, if, uh-huh. if you don't mind, I might sure. just pull up um, our podcast just so I can see a list. Great. And pick that sounds that good. Because I know <laughs> you guys have spoken about keto and that's something that I'm a yeah. huge fan of, except I don't like the label keto. I like uh-huh. low carb lifestyle. And so okay. why don't we, why don't we just go with that? Get your gut reaction it. on, on that sure. and tell me, tell us what you believe about low carb lifestyle and why that would be beneficial for most people. Yeah. So I definitely think that it, it does help for a lot of people. Again, like when I was talking about the vegan diet, some people really benefit from eating that way. They enjoy it. They feel good eating that way. Great. Same with keto. If it's done or keto, low carb, if it's done correctly and uh-huh. you're able to stick with it, then absolutely. Like it's been shown, you know, in the research we've had over the past 20 years or so, it has been shown to be beneficial for overall health, for heart, for, you know, weight management, all of those different things. My only hang up is that I think it's hard for many people to continue that lifestyle. And it's not very good for the body to cycle back and forth between low carb and then regular eating and low carb and regular eating. Um, But some people just like waking up and eating eggs and steak and they don't miss the fruit. They don't miss the toast and they don't miss all of the carbs. And so someone who just naturally enjoys those foods more, they're going to be much more able to follow that long term. So long story short, with all of the diets, you know, you could pretty much make any way of eating healthy. You Mm -hmm. do it in a smart way. But what I care more about is the sustainability of it. I'm not really into I'm going to do keto for a month. And then I'm going to go vegan for a month. And then I'm going to do carnivore diet for a month. Like your body does not like changing that drastically in such a short yeah. amount of time. Oh yeah. I think they used to call that yo-yo dieting when people have yeah. goals, but they don't know how to attain them. And having the persistence and the determination to stick with something is very difficult. Yeah, definitely. So long story short, I'm definitely the keto low carb works for some people, but uh, make sure it's sustainable for you before going all in. Right. You know, it's, de- it's definitely difficult and I can speak firsthand. Uh, it's tough not eating fruit. It's tough not eating starchy veggies. And these are things that from a chef and a, the perspective of a person who lived to eat for his entire life, not having pasta and rice and grains and all of these delicious things that have a love affair with all that. And I miss them, but I just don't eat them anymore because I want to be healthy. Right. And I think, you know, kind of circling around that comes back to your motivation. Like mm-hmm. you're probably able to, even though maybe you miss fruit and miss the things you could have made, you could have uh, made back when you um, were eating all of those foods. But your motivation now is I want to be healthy. I know this way of eating works for me. So that's enough to keep you eating in a low carb way. So that's why motivation is so important. Oh, yeah. You know, it's that that brain power aspect of it is just so difficult for most people who begin something that's difficult. They'll Mm -hmm. give it up. But that's not just with diet and nutrition. That's with exercise or playing their instruments and learning languages and everything else like that. Absolutely. What is your partner's name on the podcast? Yeah, her name's Marie Pasacrita. So when you and Marie do shows, do you you discuss different topics each time, right? Yes. yes. So okay. tell me tell me a little bit about what you guys think about intermittent fasting and autophagy that's related mm. to that. Yes. Okay. So really good question. Um, intermittent fasting 
when we're talking about just straight up weight management has been shown to be helpful for people, right? For some people, not everyone. We're not saying if you do intermittent fasting, you're definitely going to lose weight, but it does help for many people just to shorten the eating timeframe. Again, doesn't work for everyone. When it comes to all of the other benefits that they're talking about, the autophagy and, you know, lowering inflammation, making life lifespan longer, things like that. The research is there, but we need a little more to say for certain that if everyone does intermittent fasting, you will get all these benefits, but it's starting. So it is very, very exciting, very interesting. Um, for that, I think there needs to be a little bit more before I go out and tell all my clients to start doing intermittent fasting. But luckily, if it's done right, it's not definitely not um, harmful. So if you enjoy intermittent fasting, if you're one someone who feels good doing it, who naturally doesn't eat till 10 a.m. and stops at 6, that's fine. Keep doing it. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, not to the point where I say everyone has to do intermittent fasting now, but it definitely does work for some people. So you definitely address the weight management issue with intermittent fasting. And it totally makes sense from, you know, consuming calories in a smaller window. But what about autophagy? And can you explain to our audience a little bit about what autophagy is that is occurring when you are in a fasted state? Sure. So the idea of autophagy is your body has all these cells. And when you're fasted, your body is not focusing on digesting. So it can focus instead on cleaning up the cells throughout the body. So that's what autophagy means. It's basically like the body, quote unquote, eating itself, auto, autophagy. Um, so it's interesting because if we're what we typically do now, like, yes, eating throughout the whole day, the fasting window is smaller, less amount of autophagy um, will be interesting to see in future studies. OK, what does this mean? Like. I want to see a long-term study, like 10 to 20 years of people who are fasted versus non-intermittent fasting people and to see, okay, what is the difference in autophagy and what are the actual outcomes? Like what, what is the benefit of having more of this? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of potential there. You know, it appears to me, Emily, that a lot of really great science is not getting done on certain things, let's say intermittent fasting or low carb diets, because there's no real profit center there. And to fund a project like that is very expensive. To do studies is very expensive. And if, if there's no company that's going to be benefiting except just humanity, um, who's going to be funding those kind of studies when we're already now starting to see really great information coming in on that? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. A very good question. And yeah, nutrition research is difficult and complicated as it is, right? Mm -hmm. So the more money, the better. But yeah, it's just a question of where does that money come from? And yeah, you, you bring up a good point. Are there any people that you're watching on YouTube who specialize and focus on the kinds of things that we've been speaking about today, who you follow and you admire and you think uh, are worthwhile mentioning? here on our show? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the people who de who come to mind, and I'm biased because I'm another dietitian, um, I do most of my connection and social media work on Instagram. So mm -hmm. um, the people who I follow are typically on Instagram. The first one who comes to mind is, her name is Dawn Jackson Blattner, and she's a dietitian out of Chicago. I think her handle is DJ Blattner. And she is all about, I think she leans a little bit more towards the let's eat healthy whole foods most of the time, but she also does a great job of taking those healthy whole foods and making it fun. So mm -hmm. she's all into, you know, superfoods and whole food diet and all of these different things, but in a fun way that making it taste good. So she is, and she was my boss. I worked for the Chicago Cubs minor league for a couple of years and she was my boss there. So she is amazing. She's number one. Um, and then just one more person I'll, I'll shout out is another dietitian friend named Stephanie Meisen. And she worked for the Olympics out in Colorado Springs. And 
She's a chef RD, so knows a lot about food, knows a lot about the science behind food. And her handle is Cook, Eat, Compete. And lots of good recipes, very wholesome. It's about making food that tastes good, but is also packed with nutrients and leads a little bit more towards the athletic side. But those are two people I would definitely recommend following. They're fantastic. Well, thank you. That's really good to have that kind of information. Now, you, you said you worked with the Chicago Cubs farm system. Are you yes. a baseball fan? I am. Well, I'm from uh, Cleveland, Ohio, so I'm a uh, Cleveland all sports fan. But yeah, I I like watching baseball. I'm more of a football fan. Like if mm-hmm. I of all sports that I watch, I probably watch football the most. But I do like baseball as well. So who's your favorite baseball team and who's your favorite football team? Well, both are Cleveland. So the Cleveland okay. Browns football and then the uh, Cleveland Guardians for baseball are my favorite. Uh. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good. That's uh-huh. good. Yeah, we're, I'm a baseball freak myself. So, nice. um, who's your team? Definitely the Yankees. I, I was born in New York, so you know nice. they're my team, and always have been. So I, I follow them, and th- th- it's really interesting watching what's happening now in pro sports. And also, if you pay attention to nutrition and diet, like you and I do, it's interesting that they all have coaches, they all have people and specialists, and so on, following yeah. them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sports nutrition has just blown up in the past 20 years, mm-hmm. definitely in the past 20 years, like almost every professional team is now required to have a sports dietitian on staff. Um, and then, you know, the really high end athletes go to another level and get their own people as well. So right. it's good to see the importance that people put on nutrition. Oh, yeah. I'm so happy you joined us today on 50 Tastes of Grey. Emily, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to share with us? Mm, that's a great question. I think you did a really good job of asking thought provoking questions. And yeah, no, I, I think you asked it all. What's your favorite season? Summer. Getting into it right now. I like mm-hmm. warm weather. I, you know, growing up in the Midwest, it was pretty much the only time we could be outside and not have to be wearing a coat and you could just enjoy. But yeah, I like the warm weather. I like the sun. I like swimming and places I live. Summer's the best time to do that. And what part of the world are you broadcasting from right now? I'm in Palo Alto, California. So the Bay Area of San nice. Francisco. Oh, that sounds great. Well, good. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope that everybody will tune into your show called RDs versus BS. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. Super, Emily. Best of success to you. And I want to say aloha to you for now. I love that. Aloha to you as well. Thanks. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye.